So um, I want to start out with the rise of what was what's called apocalyptic literature. You all heard that word before, right? Apocalyptic literature is literature about the end of time, the end of days. And the question is, when did that kind of literature come about, and why did it come about? Okay. Last week we covered the story of uh, the Jews returning back from exile in Babylon and their expectations of the kingdom of God coming when they returned. Okay, well, it didn't happen. Um, uh, things didn't change. They were under Persian rule. Then they were under um, Greek rule. Then they were under Roman rule. Okay, so, but what did happen was that during the period when they were under Greek rule, there was this guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. I've talked about him before. Some people pronounce the, the name Epiphanes. I, I have no idea how it's really pronounced. But I like Epiphanes better. <laughs> Antiochus Epiphanes was a real nut, a, a major nut. So this guy, uh, he wanted to carry out Alexander the Great's uh, goal of Hellenizing the entire world. In other words, introducing Greek culture, you know, wherever he went. It was, a, you know, it was a little bit like the British Empire. Remember? <laughs> no, you wouldn't remember because he didn't live during that period of time. <laughs> but uh, in the 19th century, there was a there was a saying that the sun never set on the British Empire. The Brits were literally all over the world, right? Um, Australia was British. I think, uh, what's the other one over there? New Zealand, okay, they had India, they had Hong Kong. I mean, they were everywhere. Okay, spreading British culture. And Hong Kong to this day is filled with British culture. In fact, the government, when it prints, Eric was telling me, when official documents are still printed in English in Hong Kong. They now print them in both English and Cantonese, because these are Cantonese-speaking Chinese people. But English is the first language. And the church he attended was a big Anglican church, okay? So, uh, well, this Antiochus Epiphanes, unfortunately, in his attempt to Hellenize the Jews, the Jewish people, of all people on the planet, are not the people you're going to turn into something other than a Jew. Forget it. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. People have been trying it ever since uh, Israel and Judea were conquered in the 8th, and, no, the 6th and the 5th centuries, B.C. So he was going to uh, force the Jews to become, to adopt Greek culture which meant that they would have to do things that to them was shameful. For example, the Greeks would um, compete in athletic events without any clothes on. And to the Jews, they, that was, they, that was, they just couldn't do that. They wouldn't do that, okay? Um, the other thing is, he, he, he tried to put, put a statue of a Greek god on the Temple Mount of all places. Okay, so so the Jews were <clears throat> the Jews rebelled at this point, but here's the here's the thing that really changed their perspective on the world. And it's it, this was the time that apocalyptic literature began to appear. Okay. 
So um, the old idea, uh, I've talked about this before, the old idea of trying to preserve their faith in the fact that God is just in everything that God does. Okay? If, you, if you have a God who's capricious and, and, just, and acts in unpredictable ways, then how can you trust that kind of a God? Because you never know what that kind of a God is going to do. Okay? So for the Jews, God, that God is just was absolutely essential to believe. And so, prior to this, this time when they were uh, oppressed by this Greek ruler, their idea of suffering was that it had to be a punishment for sin. In other words, the person who suffered deserved it. And they didn't believe that because they didn't like people who suffered. They believed it because they figured that was the only way to preserve their belief that God is just. If God allows people to suffer, there's got to be a reason for it, right? So um, if you read the entire book of Job, the first 36 chapters are four guys arguing this doctrine of retribution, that Job must have done something wrong. That's why he suffered. Otherwise, <clears throat> everything would be hunky-dory. So they keep telling him to repent, repent. He must have done something wrong. Job says, no, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, um, so then under this Greek rule, what, what, what happened was, that the Jews who refused to conform to Greek ways, they preserved their Jewish laws that came from the Torah, observing the Sabbath, for example. This guy tried to make it illegal to observe the Sabbath. Um, sacrificing at the temple. Worshiping the one God at the temple. Uh, all of that, those who were faithful to the religion and culture of the Jewish people suffered under the Greek rule, and those who collaborated were rewarded. So how on earth can you, can you possibly uh, continue to believe that suffering is a punishment for sin when it's precisely the righteous who are suffering and the unrighteous who are not, right? Okay, so they had to get, they had to throw that idea out. Uh, this doesn't work, okay? There's got to be, God's justice has to be understood in another way. And that's when apocalyptic literature appears, okay? In apocalyptic literature, uh, it's always written in symbols. Okay, for, for example, there's two apocalyptic books in the Bible, Daniel in the Old Testament and Revelation in the New. And as you might know if you've ever read the book of Revelation, it's, it's all written in symbols. Okay, for example, in, in front of God's throne there's this beast with eyes around his head, all around it. Actually, it represents all the creatures on the earth. It's a symbol. Okay, so they, they write in symbols. Secondly, um, their subject is always the end of time. What's going to happen at the end of time? Okay, so keep in mind, that number one, the question is, how is God just? And... The second question is, what is going to happen at the end of time? Okay, so if suffering is not to be explained as a punishment for sin, 
And Jesus, by the way, you know, in the Gospel of John, his disciples asked him straight out when they encountered a blind man at the Pool of Siloam. We visited there in Jerusalem. The Pool of Siloam. Um, there was a blind man. And the disciples said, Who sinned, him or his parents, that he was born blind? See, they were still thinking that way. Okay. So Jesus said, nobody sinned. You know, he threw that doctrine out. And he said, this is an opportunity for me to show you how God responds to suffering. And then he healed it. Okay? So it was a demonstration of God's love and mercy in the face of suffering. That's how God responds to suffering. So it's not a punishment. All right? In apocalyptic literature, the explanation then that preserves the idea that God is just in everything that God does is that, number one, there's a power of evil in the world that is stronger than the human will can resist. Okay, that's, that's the first principle they adopted. Okay, and that eventually becomes the devil. Uh, there were various names given to it. The devil, Beelzebul, and, and Satan. Okay, so there's a power of evil. They, they didn't believe that the evil committed could be explained by just saying, well, people have free will and they, they, they can act in evil ways because they have free will. And the reason they didn't believe that is because some of the evil they saw in the world was so horrific that it looked as if the people committing it were under the influence of something. And it, this reminded me, I think I saw this in a movie, but um, it was 1930s Germany, okay? And Hitler and his minions were starting to round up Jews, put them on trains, and send them to the death camp. And this Jewish lady was told that this was going on. She was very sophisticated, intellectually, uh, culturally, very sophisticated, wealthy Jewish woman in Berlin. And she was told, get out of here, because you know the Nazis are, are, are going to come for you. And her remark was, this is the country of Beethoven and Goethe and all these artistic geniuses. It can't be that the Germans would commit such a horrific crime as the Holocaust. She just couldn't believe it. Well, the Jewish people in the ancient world couldn't believe what they were seeing either. So, they decided there's got to be a power of evil at work in the world that influences human behavior in such a way that human beings do things. You see, prior to Hitler, the Germans were just normal people like everybody else. They didn't show any signs of being doing evil things. Evil pops up all the time in places where you, you never know where it's going to pop up. I mean, in this country, for example, these mass shootings. I'll never forget, uh, remember the one that, that took place in Las Vegas? I couldn't believe over 50 people died in that mass shooting. I thought, who would do such a thing? It was, it was starting to drive me out of my mind, uh, the news of all these mass shootings. Okay, so, you know, it pops up, and, and uh, the Jews, in their, in their struggle to try and understand what's going on, decided that there's a power of evil 
that eventually, okay, in the end of days, God is going to defeat this power of evil, free human beings from it, and then God would introduce his direct rule and, 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 and paradise would return. It, it, it's the exact reverse of the story of Adam and Eve. The story of Adam and Eve is the story of how two people disobey God and they're banished from paradise. In apocalyptic literature, paradise returns to the earth. Remember the book of Revelation says that the holy city of Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth and paradise returns. All tears are wiped away. There's no more sorrow. There's no more suffering. And there's no more death. All right? So, <clears throat> uh, what apocalyptic literature suggested was that at the end of days there would be a resurrection from the dead. Evil would be punished. In other words, like Adam and Eve, they would be banished from paradise. And those who remained faithful to God would become part of God's kingdom in his direct rule on earth. So that's what apocalyptic literature is about. Now there's one phrase in the book of Daniel that is important for Christians. Uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> Daniel is talking about how the kingdom of God is going to come to earth. And he says that he saw a vision of one like a son of man descending on the clouds of heaven. And, and this son of man, in other words, a, a person whose origin is heaven, God's realm, not the human realm, God's realm, comes to earth in the form of a human being in order to inaugurate God's kingdom on earth. That's the idea Daniel is trying to get for. All right. Now, um, the book of Daniel was written in the second century BC. All right. So maybe 160, 180, something like that BC. Um, so we're getting close to the first century. Then. Okay, so th th what this what apocalyptic literature does that it preserves the idea that God is just because God is going to even the scales at the end of time. Evil will be punished and good will be rewarded. That will even the scales. In the meantime, we have to deal with evil. But at the end of time, God is going to take care of it. Okay? He's going to wipe it out. Um, and God's kingdom will rock. So, this kind of literature is popping up, especially in the 3rd and the 2nd century B.C. And then, we get to the 1st century, early in the 1st century. And a very mysterious figure comes out of nowhere, lives on locusts and honey out in the wilderness, and at the Jordan River proclaims that the kingdom of God is at hand and the Messiah is about to come. Who am I talking about? John the Baptist. Exactly. Okay, so if you're a first century Jew, and because of this complete change in perspective that apocalyptic literature had uh, accomplished among Jews, what you're hearing is that, oh, the end of days is coming, and the Messiah who's going to inaugurate 
God's kingdom, where, uh, whereby God will directly rule God's people through his mercy and his love, that's what will, uh, uh, that's the reality people will live in, okay? And sorrow and death and suffering will be no more, okay, under God's direct rule. That's what people are hearing John say. And the reason John calls for repentance is because that's the way to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Okay? Return to the Lord your God. Those are words that come directly from the prophet Joel. We read them every year on Ash Wednesday. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful, forgiving, and he will accept you back. Okay? So that's what John was telling people to do. Because the kingdom was at hand, the Messiah was about to come. And then, in the year 28 AD, along comes Jesus of Nazareth to John the Baptist. And John takes one look at him and says, why are you coming to me for baptism? I need to be baptized by you. And what he meant by that was that Jesus wouldn't baptize with water. Jesus would baptize with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit is our connection to God. That's how uh, we are empowered to have not only faith in God, but we are empowered to stand against evil, to not come under its influence, okay? And uh, live a life that is pleasing to God, uh, reflecting God's love in the way we live our lives. Okay, so, <clears throat> so Jesus um, clearly uh, is identified as this one who was to come, uh, that um, the Jews, you know, were expecting. This messianic expectation took place at that time in Jewish history. Uh, it doesn't exist today. The, the Jews aren't looking for a Messiah today. But back then they were. Okay? And, um, but but here, here's the problem. Many of them were thinking of the Messiah in a political sense. In other words, the Messiah would resemble a figure like King David. And the reason they admired King David so much that even Jesus called him the great king was because he was the guy who united the 12 tribes of Israel in about the year 1000. That's when King David was ruling. But he was a warlord. He did it through violence. Okay, he fought off the Philistines. He fought off the Ammonites. He expanded the kingdom of Israel. He united the 12 tribes. He established Jerusalem as his capital. Uh, I mean, this guy accomplished, uh, you know, so many things in Jewish history that, that he was elevated to this, this. Okay, so people were thinking, number one, the Messiah would descend from King David. Right? He would be a descendant of David. And number two, he would resemble King David. So many of the, many, many of the people were expecting a Messiah that would come and eliminate oppressive foreign rule among the Jews, set them free, and enable them to live as a free, independent, flourishing people under God's rule. That's what they were expecting. 
so then along comes Jesus okay now how does he announce that he's the Messiah how does he do that in the Gospel of Luke it records that as he begins his ministry he returns to his hometown of Nazareth this is after his baptism by John and his temptations in the wilderness he returns to his hometown and at a Sabbath celebration in the, in, the, in the local synagogue, he is given uh, the Hebrew Bible. And it's open to a passage in Isaiah. And he's asked to read it. And the passage he reads is where Isaiah is predicting the coming of God's kingdom. Okay? Um, it goes something like this. I have been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to make the blind see, to enable the deaf to hear, to heal people. In other words, there's all these things that, that the Messiah would do to demonstrate his divine power demonstrate that his origin is heaven even though he's a human being so Jesus reads this passage <clears throat> then he sets the Bible down and he says matter-of-factly this reading has been fulfilled in your hearing in other words I'm the guy he's talking about all right um, He's pretty clear about that. Um, his hometown <laughs> reacted. <laughs> they, of course, they, they knew him because he grew up there, right? Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the brother of James? And doesn't he have the, his sisters still live here? And his mother, Mary? We know all these people. Who is he telling us that he's the Messiah? So. They, they get angry with him, <clears throat> and he just <clears throat> somehow escapes the crowd, leaves, goes to Capernaum, begins his ministry. Now, Jesus' ministry consists of the following things. <clears throat> First of all, he's a healer, okay? What he's doing in that healing... Um, in his power to heal is demonstrating that when God's kingdom arrives there won't be disease and sickness there won't be blindness there won't be paralysis people will be uh, in their in their resurrected bodies they, they, there will, they will not be subject to this kind of pain and suffering, okay? So he demonstrates that by healing people. A leper comes to him. The lepers are all of a sudden clean. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law has a fever, probably malaria. He just takes her hand and she's fine. A little girl dies in the village of Nain. He tells all the people there, no, she just fell asleep. They laugh at him. He, he's, he, he goes into the room, takes her by the hand. Talitha kum, which means little girl rise. She gets up and walks out of the room. Okay, so he's demonstrating his divine power. Why? Because that's what the Messiah is sent to do. To inaugurate God's kingdom, he needs to demonstrate his power over the, the sources of suffering and death in the world. All right? And he does that by, by, by healing, feeding 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread, and, and uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. You know, he does all these things. John calls them signs because they, they, they point to the fact that here's the Messiah. All right? 
So, here's the problem. After doing all of those things and teaching people nonviolence, uh, don't become the very thing you hate. Okay, here's, here's the way he looks at violence. Uh, some people th think violence is necessary in order to change the world for the better. Right? That's not the way Jesus looks at it. The way he looks at it is that when you use violence, you're becoming the very thing you're trying to fight against. You can't do away with violence with violence. It won't work. And ultimately, we see that um, happening. Now I'm jumping way ahead. Okay, when the Christian movement starts out with with about I don't know, maybe about a hundred people. There were the disciples, the Jesus family, and, 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 and a bunch of others, the women, and a bunch of others who who, who were convinced he was the Messiah. These are just common people. Okay, they form a community. Um, the, the, the community takes care of each other. The apostles go out into the world and, and, and proclaim that the kingdom of God has arrived in Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about what that means in a second. And, and um, Christianity begins to grow. Churches appear all over the Roman world. And during the first three centuries of the church, persecutions break out periodically where the Romans try to stamp out this Christian movement because these people worship a different Lord, Caesar's Lord, not this guy who was crucified, this crucified criminal. How can you call him a Lord? Okay, so they try to stamp it out. It doesn't work. And the church throughout this period never uses violence. Not one time does the church ever violently try to overturn anything in Roman society. They use kindness and compassion that brings more and more people in. And by the end of the um, fourth century, Christianity wins over the entire Roman Empire. I mean, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, and then, of course, it spreads throughout the whole world, and now it's it's, it's still the, the largest religion in the world. So anyway, but, but that's how it started out, right? Okay, so um, so first Jesus is this healer who, who, who demonstrates that God's uh, kingdom is coming through him. Okay? You have access to God through me, Jesus is telling them. Okay, not through the temple, not, not through some idol. You have access to God through me. His, his, the direct quote in John is, I am, uh, how does it go? I am the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. There you go, the way, the truth, and the life. He says it directly. You have access to God through me. That's why I'm here. Okay? So, um, there's no more need for the temple. When, when he dies on the cross, the temple curtain tears in half as if God exits the temple. Uh, it's a symbolic way of demonstrating that. Okay, but here's the problem. What the first century Jewish people are seeing is another guy claiming to be the Messiah who ends up crucified and dead. Okay, there were many of them. All right, 
But here's the difference. When other people claiming to be the Messiah ended up dead because the Romans crucified or executed them for treason, for not acknowledging Caesar as Lord. When those other messiahs ended up dead, their movement ended. Their followers dispersed. The whole thing just went away. But when Jesus ended up dead, what happens? All of a sudden you have this, this major movement, okay, that starts with 12 fishermen, actually 11, and, and a guy named Paul, who initially was an enemy of Christ, okay? So how could that possibly be? Uh, it's, it's, it's not hard to understand why Jesus wasn't accepted by the Jewish people as their Messiah. Because what most of them saw was another crucified claimant to be the king of the Jews. Most of them did not see him rise from the dead. But some did. And those who did formed a community. Okay. So it was... Um, I don't think it's possible to explain the rise of early Christianity in any other way than that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, some of those stories are absolutely fascinating to me. Two guys are walking on their way to a maze. They have a conversation with him all the way. And they don't even know who he is until at the very end, when he breaks bread. The disciples are gathered behind closed doors. They're afraid because they're, they, they, they think that the, 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 the Jewish authorities who turned Jesus over to Pilate will also come after them. All of a sudden, Jesus appears in the room. He didn't come through a door. He didn't crawl in through a window. He just appeared. And uh, then a second time, for the sake of Thomas, who didn't believe it, right? Remember that story? Okay. So th this this <clears throat> this group of Galilean fishermen who are scared out of their wits that they're going to end up just like their master. Something happens, and all of a sudden. They're out in public preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. How do you explain that? Some people try, try to suggest that, well, they stole the body. If they knew it was a lie all along, they never would have accomplished what they did. They never would have allowed themselves to die for their faith if they knew it was a lie all along. Okay. So, <clears throat> here's the theological point that's really important about this. The theological point is, okay, the Messiah, the expectation of the Messiah was that he would overcome evil, sin, and death. Most people thought he would do that through a violent revolution. Okay? Jesus didn't do that. In fact, he wept over Jerusalem because he knew what would happen when they were bailed, that, 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 that the city would be destroyed. So he weeps over Jerusalem. He's not a political messiah. So how can we say he overcomes sin and death? Well, the disciples, after he rose from the dead, began to read their own Bible 
in a different way. They began to see things in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, differently than people saw them before Jesus rose from the dead. For example, the suffering servant passages in Isaiah about a servant who, who, who took on our iniquities, died for our sins. His death made us whole. They began to read these and understand what happened. Okay? Jesus overcomes death and sin by number one, first bearing God's judgment against sin himself on our behalf on the cross. Okay? He takes on that judgment and suffers it. Which means that we can be declared innocent and righteous even though we're not because he took away our sin. Secondly, he overcomes death, not by doing away with it, but by dying and then overcoming it by rising again from the dead. That's how he overcomes death. Okay? So, um, so, so death isn't something that goes away. Death is something that you go through. It's like a tunnel now. Okay? For Jesus, death was a tunnel. You die, but you rise again. And when you rise again, you rise to never die again. That's how you win a victory over death. And all those people who are connected to God through Christ, are also then connected to the power that Christ had to overcome evil and suffering and finally even death. Okay? So the promise is that the kingdom of God has actually come in this sense. Now, next week we're going to talk about how that happens. How does it happen that we can access the power Jesus had? How does that happen? Um, because when we come into a relationship with Christ, where he, where, where he is acknowledged as our Lord, Above all other things in life, he, he's at the top of the pyramid, okay? Um, when that happens, we, we live under God's rule, rather under the rule of Caesar. Now, the early church demonstrated what that means. What that meant for them, what it means for us, you all have to decide in your own life. Okay, each of us uh, are going to confront evil and sin in some way in the world. All of us are going to do that because it's real, it's out there. The question is are we going to get taken in by it? Or are we going to be able to access the power of Christ to be freed from it and stand against it? Now, the early church demonstrated their power to stand against it by actually being martyred by the Roman Empire rather than obeying Caesar. They were willing to die in order to be obedient to Christ instead of obeying Caesar. 
I mean, it's, it's like this. We, we have a letter from a Roman governor in Asia Minor. His name was Pliny. Pliny writes to Caesar. What do I do with these Christians? I don't, you know, this religion is illegal, but I don't know what to do with them. What do you want me to do with them? I think I told you the story already. And sometimes I repeat this. Um, and he gets a letter back from Caesar. And Caesar says, well, let's not, uh, let's not initiate a, investigation and try to, try to, to, you know, to, to go house to house and find them and persecute them. And that's, let's not do that. He says, however, if someone comes to you and says, my neighbor's a Christian, then you're going to have to give them a choice. And the choice is either curse Christ and make it a sacrifice to Caesar or die. That's the, that was their choice. Now many of the saints in the Catholic Church, I'll never forget the, uh, did you guys watch on TV the funeral of Pope John Paul II? Do you remember him? You know who I'm talking about, right? Long time ago. I think back in, uh, uh, well, I was in California at the time, so it was in the 90s, <coughs> early, early 90s. It was at the time when the, when the Berlin Wall fell. It was at that time. Okay, okay so during that uh, funeral, the Catholic Church has a, uh, has a liturgical I don't think you'd call it a hymn, but it's sung. It's a liturgical piece. And they, they go through all the saints. Okay, and they were doing that during the funeral of John Paul II. Well, the vast majority of those saints that they were naming were people who were martyred for their faith. And there's a theologian at the time by the name of Tertullian. He came from North Africa. And his statement was the blood of the martyrs actually grows the church. Because what happened is that people saw that Christians were willing to die for their faith. And they admired that so much that many of them convert precisely because of that. So um, here's here's what we'll end with. Um, let's go to the last page. They, by they, I mean the early, early Christians. They came to realize that he, Jesus, didn't do away with sin and death by some kind of violent revolution. He conquered sin by bearing its consequences, namely by suffering God's judgment against sin himself, even though he was sinless. His death, therefore, reconciled the sinful humanity to God. By bearing our sin, we could be declared righteous as a gift from God. Moreover, he didn't conquer death by avoiding it. He defeated it by going through it. He demonstrated that death can't hold anyone who lives under the influence of his power. By rising from the dead, he made it clear that God had power over death. He was the victor. Death was defeated. However, the story isn't over. Clearly, Jesus' disciples and all others who followed him then and in the future were given the power to live a new life. 
their lives were transformed by what he did. It was as if now there was a road that led to God's kingdom. It was now possible for human beings to become empowered by the love and rule of God. How does this happen? How is it that one man's victory over sin and death becomes something we can participate in? We will turn to this question next week.